Okay, so Tuesday afternoon and therefore we are once again doing a live stream. And today we are going through the 2017 AQA Paper 1. And that is the A-level biology paper, not the AS paper. However, it's worth you noting, AS biology students, that we're actually running through A-level standard questions on the year 12 content. And that, so therefore, going through this paper will actually be really quite useful for you. So let's get started. I do have an issue this afternoon, just so that you're aware. I do have an issue that my second screen, for some reason, isn't working. So I'm going to struggle to see questions. I might, might be able to handle them maybe about halfway through. So um, bear with me. If you have some questions, type them in. And, and I will endeavor to answer them halfway through. So question one, give the two types of molecule from which a ribosome is made. And that is of course, ribosomal RNA and protein. And here are here is the mark scheme. Here are the examiner's notes on this side and therefore I get the mark. Describe the role of a ribosome in the production of a polypeptide. Do not include transcription in your answer. And that kind of makes sense because transcription doesn't involve the ribosome. So here is what I put. So I said the role of the ribosome, so my headline answer is the ribosome bonds the amino acids together using peptide bonds. And then I'm kind of going, hold on, this is a three mark question. So what extra detail can I put in? And then I go into describing the A-level biology detail of the process of translation. So the ribosome attaches to the start of the mRNA. tRNAs carrying specific amino acids bind to the codons on the mRNA, those codons, are those sets of three bases on the mRNA using the tRNA anticodons by complementary base pairing. As I am writing this, I am thinking ahead and thinking of the terminology that I can get into my sentences. And again, I put in that detail, A to U, C to G, to show the examiner I know it. Hardly any more time or words written. Once the ribosome has bonded the first two amino acids, the first tRNA leaves the ribosome. The mRNA moves along the mRNA one codon at a time, bonding the amino acids until the stop codon is reached. This, and I've just realized I've written, this is translocation, clearly an absolute load of rubbish. It is translation, not translocation. So here is the mark scheme, and here is where I got the marks. And it was a three mark question. I ended up with four marks, um, so therefore would have got the maximum of three marks. I should say that when I prepare these videos, I just do a whole load of copying and pasting. I copy all the questions, then I copy all the mark scheme and the examiner's comments. I am not at this stage reading the flipping mark schemes at all. And then I go back to the start of my PowerPoint and I really try and put what I would have written in the answer without looking at the mark scheme on the side of the PowerPoint so that you kind of get the best idea as to what I would have actually written. So you are going to see where I've gained marks but also where I've missed marks. And we can chat about that as we go along. So complete the table. And I should also say that if you're watching in video land, in other words, in YouTube land, not live now, of course, hit the pause button so that you can look at the questions yourself, see what you would have written, see whether I agree with you and see whether the mark scheme agrees with you. So complete the table with the base sequence of the DNA strand from which this pre-mRNA was transcribed. And that, of course, is complementary base pairs using the DNA bases. So therefore, I have got T's in this sequence, not U's. So I get the mark there. 
Why is the base sequence of the mRNA different from pre-mRNA? Well, that's because of the difference between pre-mRNA and mRNA. In other words, the introns have been taken out as a result of splicing. And there's the mark scheme. Here are the notes. And there I've got my marks. In mammals, the early stages of pregnancy, a developing embryo exchanges substances with the mother via the lining of the uterus. At this stage, there is a high concentration of glycogen in the cells lining the uterus. Describe the structure of glycogen. Well, my initial thought is it's loads of alpha glucoses joined together and it is a branched molecule. So this is what I wrote. Notice that when I got to it's made up of many alpha glucoses, I did kind of think, oh, hold on, I can put in here either it is a polymer. And then I thought polysaccharide is a better term than polymer. So hence, that's what I put. Um, and I wasn't sure that I wouldn't sure where the marks were. So here, this is my kind of added bit. But it does say, I'm going to be honest, it does say the structure of glycogen, not its properties. So actually, I'm not surprised that this is the mark scheme. So I got mark point one and mark point two. Suggest how glycogen acts as a source of energy. So we've got to get from glycogen to a source of energy. So and of course, we're going to go via alpha glucose because, of course, Glycogen is made up of alpha glucose. So the alpha glucose is taken off the glycogen as a result of hydrolysis. And I put in of the terminal ends of the highly branch molecule. Um, and then, of course, how do we get the energy? Well, that is, of course, by the process of respiration. Hence the second part of my answer. So I got the two marks there. Suggest and explain two ways the cell surface membranes of the cells lining the uterus may be adapted to allow the rapid transport of nutrients. Well, my immediate thought was, well, perhaps they have got microvilli on them to increase the surface area. And maybe they have got lots of channel or carrier proteins to increase. Now, when I got to the word increase, I realized that I'd said channel and carrier proteins. And I could have, and I was running out of lines. And I could have said for either active transport or facilitated diffusion, because I kind of knew which was which. But of course, the examiner wouldn't. So I just plumped for saying for increased facilitated diffusion. I could have gone on to say, or increase or and increase carrier proteins for increased active transport. But I didn't, I ran out of lines and I would have run out of time if I was doing this two time. So here is the marks where the mark, this is where I got the marks. So I got the microvilli because of here and because of facilitated diffusion. I could have also said, notice, I could have talked about active transport, as I said. So here is a maths question talking about cell division. We're starting with one cell. The first cell division takes 24 hours. All subsequent divisions take eight hours. After three days, the embryo has a total volume of this number. What is the mean volume of each cell after three days? Well, we've got to work out the number of cells that are in that total volume. And therefore, here am I drawing a silly little diagram just to remind me that it takes 24 hours to double once and then eight hours to double each subsequent time. So I've got to work out how many, I've got to take 24 hours away from three days, so that leaves me with two days, and then I've got to work out how many eight hours there are in two days. And that, of course, 
is 48 hours divided by eight, which is six, and then plus one because the other 24 hours was a cell division. So I've got seven cell divisions in three days. But notice that each division doubles the number of cells. So the two is indicating the doubling and it happens seven times. It's two times two times two times two times two, seven times, which equals 128 cells. So the embryo has 128 cells in it. And therefore I'm dividing this number by 128, which gives me this number here. And that was the correct answer. So I get both the marks. Sodium ions are absorbed by cells lining the gut. Some of these cells have a carrier protein called NHE3. NHE3 actively transports one sodium ion into the cell and one proton or hydrogen ion out of the cell in each turn. Use your knowledge of transport across cell membranes to suggest how it does this. Now, I'm going to be really honest. This was the one question on this paper where I kind of went off on one a little bit with my teacher knowledge because immediately I heard the description. It made me think of the sodium potassium pump, which is active transport. However, I'm going to be honest, this is unlike me, but this is you don't have to know the details of how the sodium potassium pump works. But I know, and you probably have learned in year 13, that the sodium potassium pump pumps three sodium ions out of the cell and brings two potassium ions in. And this sounded really familiar to me. So I adapted my knowledge of the sodium potassium pump to explain how this carrier protein worked. So this is what I wrote, that the binding of the sodium ions and ATP to NHE3 causes it to change shape and therefore release the sodium ions. This then allows the hydrogen ions to bind, it changes shape again as a result of that binding and therefore releases the hydrogen ions out of the cell. This is the mark scheme, which is clearly simpler and actually more accessible to you guys than probably the detail that I put in this answer. Three marks and here's, here is, um, here's the notes from the examiners and I got the three marks. Scienti scientists investigating the use of a drug called tenapanor to increase salt absorption in the gut, in the gut. It inhibits that transport protein. It's going to stop those sodium ions. Hold on, let's just check the sodium ions into the cell. The sodium ions go into the cell. So scientists fed a diet containing a high concentration of salt to two groups of rats, A and B. A were not given tenapanol, B were given tenapanol. An hour after the science, an hour after treatment, the scientist removed the gut contents, not really sure I want to know how, and immediately weighed them. And the um, concentration, so this is, um, sorry, so this is, this is group A, this is group B. And the mean mass contents doubled in the group with tenapanol. Now, this is where you need to recognize that an increase in mass, because we're kind of thinking about sodium ions moving, I'm kind of going, this increase in mass is because of more water inside the gut contents. And so, now let's carry on. So I'm kind of immediately, I am already thinking, oh, increased in mass, more water, we're talking osmosis, it's probably water potential. So um, they calculated that a p-value was less than 0.05 
and therefore it definitely did reduce the salt absorption into the gut. In other words, the salt wasn't being taken out of the gut contents into the cells that lined the gut. Use all the information provided and your knowledge of water potential, there's your big clue, to explain how they reached this conclusion. So partly it's about how did they reach this conclusion? So partly it's about explaining the significance of P is less than 0.05. So my first part of my answer is talking about the P value. When P is less than 0.05, it means that there is less than a 5% probability that the difference between the two means, i.e. 2 and 4.1, is due to chance. And therefore, it is statistically significant. This, and then I go into my biological explanation. This is because tenapanol um, stopped salt absorption and therefore the water potential of the gut contents would be lowered because there would be more salt in the gut contents and therefore the water would move from the cells of the lining of the gut into the gut by osmosis and therefore the gut contents would weigh more. And here are the mark schemes and the notes and this is where I got the marks and I got all four marks as a result. The crucial thing here was recognizing that you had to explain statistically why they reached the conclusion and then explain the biology behind it. High absorption of salt from the, gut, from the diet can result in a higher than normal concentration of salt in the blood plasma entering the capillaries. This can lead to a buildup of tissue fluid. So I'm thinking if there is a high concentration of sodium ions in the blood plasma, that is going to be filtered out into the tissue fluid at the arterial end of the capillary. So we have now got tissue fluid with more than usual sodium ions in it. That of course is going to lower the water potential of the tissue fluid. And you'll remember that at the venous end of the capillary, the reason that the blood volume is increased is because water moves by osmosis down the water potential gradient into the blood at the venule end of the capillaries. And of course, that isn't going to happen as much if the water potential in the tissue fluid is lowered. There isn't going to be such a concentration or a water potential gradient than there would have been normally. The concentration gradient has become less steep and therefore, less, um, there would be more tissue fluid left in the tissues. Okay, here's the mark scheme and the examiner's notes. And here is where I got the marks. Okay, bacteria are often used as a source of enzymes. One, one reason is because bacteria divide brilliantly quickly and therefore you basically have a natural increase in the amount of enzymes. Describe how bacteria divide. Well, I know that what they are looking for, at least one of these marks is because I'm gonna say by binary fission, and I'm not gonna make the mistake that it's by mitosis. Because of course, bacteria only have one circular chromosome and circular chromosomes can't do that dance of the chromosomes that happens in mitosis. Therefore, I've just said that the naked circular DNA replicates followed by cytokinesis, the splitting of the cytoplasm of the cell. And here is the mark scheme. And here, I think I only, oh, I did, yes, I was able to give myself both marks. Yes, I got the two marks. Now, 
I've copied this graph onto the next slide, but let's just take in what this question is about. Washing powders often contain enzymes. These enzymes include proteases that hydrolyze proteins in clothing stains. Breaking down those large molecules into small soluble ones, which of course can get washed away in the washing water or dissolve in the washing water and be drained away. Figure one shows the effect of temperature on a protease that could be used in washing powder. Notice your Y axis. This is the percentage of maximum protease activity. And at 30 degrees C, it stays at its maximum activity. At 50 degrees, it drops off quite sharply and then kind of far, far less sharply. But at 60 degrees, the activity drops like a stone, goes right down to zero at 30 minutes. So here's the question. Explain the shape of the curves at 50 degrees and 60 degrees. So I said that at, I can't remember actually what I said, what did I say? At 60 degrees, the protease is quickly and completely denatured. So that's my first bit of explanation. And I'm just making sure that they know that I've understood the percentage of maximum activity falling to zero by 30 minutes. I'm going to be honest, that is, I'm going to be honest here, let me just find this. This, in effect, is a description of the graph. Here is the explanation. This is a description. I put it in so that they realized that I understood what was happening in the graph. But notice we're not asked to describe and explain the shape of the graph. We're just asked to explain it. At 50 degrees, the protease is partially denatured, dropping to 55 degrees. Now I said it was partially denatured because there is still some activity left. And that is what I go on to explain, that it drops to 30% by 180 minutes, there is still some activity. So not every single enzyme molecule has been denatured. And then I go on to explain what denaturation is. Denaturation occurs because the hydrogen bonds and the ionic bonds in the tertiary structure of the enzyme are broken. And that means that the shape of the active site always talk about the shape of the active site. Never just talk about the shape of the whole enzyme. Always talk about the shape of the active site. No longer is complementary to the substrate. The substrate no longer fits. Here is the mark scheme. Now, personally, I wouldn't actually agree with mark point one. I understand that they're both partially denatured, at least. But funnily enough, I didn't give myself mark point one. Because, oh, no, I did give myself mark point one. Of course I did. Yes, because I said that they were both denatured. What I didn't, yeah, what I failed to do on this question is actually note that the denaturation is much faster at 60 degrees. My bad. Silly old me for forgetting it. So here is mark point three and here is mark point four. I got three out of the four marks, which, frankly, I'm quite happy with. Proteases are secreted or as extracellular enzymes by bacteria. What is one advantage to them having extracellular enzymes? Well, it means they can digest proteins in their environment and therefore absorb the amino acids so that they can build up. So why is that an advantage? Because that means they can then build up their own proteins from the amino acids that they've absorbed. So I got the one mark to digest the protein. And here's the thing. So here's the funny thing about A-level exam answers. A lot of my answers, I write more than, it, than what is in the mark scheme. Because although I might have a good inkling as to what is in the mark scheme, I don't quite know how much I'm going to have to write to nail each individual mark point. And here is a classic case of, I could have so easily 
have just left it as oh, and then they can absorb the um, the the amino acids. But I desire I decided to extend my answer to say so that they could then build up proteins, um, and that was what got me the mark that extended answer. So please notice that while I'm going through this exam. I am not just rewriting the mark scheme. I am genuinely writing what I would have written. And sometimes I bag the marks and sometimes I don't. Mammals have cells that produce extracellular proteases. Yeah, they also have cells with membrane bound dipeptidases. Describe the action of these dipeptidases and explain their importance. Well, the first bit is easy. The, the action is that they break the single peptide bond to produce two amino acids because dipeptides break down to two amino acids. And then I had to explain what was the advantage of them being, or in my mind, I was thinking, what is the advantage of them being membrane bound? And that was harder. I found that much harder to think of. And and so, you know, I'm going to be going to be honest. I felt like I was dredging the bottom of the barrel. So what I kind of thought, well, if those enzymes are right stuck next to the membrane itself, because they're on the membrane, it's going to increase the concentration gradient because those amino acids are going to be broken down right next to the membrane and therefore you're going to have a met the highest possible concentration of amino acids on the outside in comparison to the inside so therefore it could increase their absorption by diffusion so that is what i wrote here's the mark scheme here's the examiner's comments so i got mark point one notice that you you had to use the word hydrolyze and mark point two that um that it increased the or maintained a concentration gradient okay question five human bladder infection caused by a species of bacterium this species of bacterium is often resistant to the antibiotics used to treat it they investigated a new antibiotic it inhibits ATP synthase. Put a tick next to the right equation. So, and you know, I, it was really funny. I had to actually think about this, which was weird, isn't it? Um, because I had to kind of go, okay, ATP to ADP is hydrolysis. ADP plus PI to ATP is condensation. And therefore, so what is it? Oh, the, the reaction that is catalyzed by ATP synthase. This is making ATP. So, so therefore, you are producing water as this reaction happens. So therefore, it is this answer. And that was right. The new antibiotic is safe to use in humans because it does not inhibit the ATP synthase found in human cells. Suggest why not? Well, it must be because the human ATP synthase has actually got a slightly different tertiary structure and therefore a slightly different shape of the active site. And therefore, it is no longer, it has, um, it's a different shape and therefore isn't complementary. Um, uh, the, in, in the inhibitor isn't complementary. Oh, hold on. Oh, yes, because here am I, here am I, I'm just realizing that I am absolutely assuming that it is competitive inhibition. So I did get the marks, but I'm sitting here kind of going, oh, did I, did I get that right? Oh, and I, I got the mark um, anyway. OK. They tested this new antibiotic on mice with the same bladder infection, three groups of mice. C is the control, which were not treated. R is the old antibiotic and A is the new antibiotic. 
and they removed samples from the bladder and counted the number of bacteria, estimated the total number of bacteria. Antibiotics were given to the mice a dose of 25 mg per kilogram per day. Calculate how much antibiotic would be given to a 30 gram mouse each day. Well, we've got to work out the fraction of 30 grams out of a kilogram. And a kilogram is 1,000 grams. So it's 30 over 1,000 times by 25 milligrams, which equals that. And I got both marks. Calculate the percentage difference in actual numbers. Notice here we've got log 10 numbers of bacteria in group A compared with group R. The actual number of bacteria can be calculated from the log 10 value by using the 10 to the power x function on a calculator. They help you out here. Show you're working. Now, calculating a percentage difference means that you can either calculate the percentage increase or the percentage decrease. You can choose. There will be the possibility in the mark scheme for both of them. I decided to do percentage decrease. Yes, I'm sure I did. Yes. So here am I showing my working. R is 1 times 10 to the power of 2.85. This is me estimating from this graph. And A is 1.3. So A is 10, 1 times 10 to the 1.3. So here am I now doing the percentage decrease. The higher value minus the lower value divided by the original higher value because you are trying to work out what this difference is as a proportion of this higher number, the original number, and times it by 10 to give you a percentage. And that ends up being, and I can't remember what it is because I can't see it, it's 97.2, which I got. So therefore, I got both the marks. Notice, just to say, notice in the mark scheme, if you had worked out the percentage increase, in other words, the difference and then in comparison to the original lower value, you would have also got the right answer. It was allowed for in the um, in the mark scheme. Sorry, just realized I got that a bit wrong. OK, the scientists suggested that people newly diagnosed with this bladder infection should be treated with both the current antibiotic, which seems to be the better antibiotic, and the new antibiotic. Explain why scientists made this suggestion. Use information from figure two and your knowledge of the evolution of antibiotic resistance in your answer. Come back to this. Look, the species of bacterium R is often resistant to antibiotics. So, but notice they also want us to use information from figure two to back up our reasoning. So this is what I wrote. Because the combination of R and A antibiotics would kill a greater percentage of the bacteria, as the two antibiotics work by different mechanisms. Therefore, bacteria resistant to R would be killed by A. You're hoping that this would be a cumulative um, effect. If those bacteria resistant to R are killed, they cannot survive and reproduce. Here am I going into evolution of antibiotic resistance. They cannot survive and reproduce and pass on their resistance allele to future generations. This would reduce the prevalence of R resistant bacteria. Here's the mark scheme, and here is what I got. I said that one anti no, yeah, I said that one antibiotic would kill bacteria that are resistant to another antibiotic. And then I talked about resistant bacteria would reproduce to produce resistant bacteria. But notice here that I could talk about passing on resistance alleles. And therefore, I got just two of the marks out of three. 
Now, just going to quickly go back. I'm going to stop sharing. Quickly have a look at whether there are any questions. <laughs> Thank you, Lifting with Sammy, um, for your comment. I do appreciate that. Um, sadly, I only have, for some bizarre reason, one screen at the moment. So I will come back at the end to um, to carry and carry on and deal with questions um, at the end. OK, because I'm trying to do this in the most efficient way that I can to get through this paper um, quickly. All right. Let us keep going then. Hold on, just checking that I've got this right. Yes, I have, okay, pretty sure. Very disconcerting not having a second screen. Okay. All right, really quick plug for my website. I have got pretty much the whole of the A-level um, syllabuses for AQA and OCRA all being taught by short videos, each video having exam questions on that topic being gone through by me at the end of each video. I have them all on my website. The reason that I can carry on doing YouTube, which earns me very, very little, because there are only 10,000 of you, which is tiny in YouTube terms. This is how I fund what I'm doing. All of those videos, you can subscribe to them for £50 for a whole year, okay, which is about the cost of one hour of private tuition. If you just need the AS ones, that's £25 for the whole year. And because I am absolutely committed to this being available for students who do not have loads of money in the family, I give 10% commission on any of your friends' purchases. So if you buy the subscription and then get, there's a mechanism by which you can enter and earn 10%, you could actually earn your money back or even make a profit. And there's a freebie on the website. So do just go and grab that if nothing else. Okay, onwards and upwards. Question six. This 2,4-D is a selective herbicide that kills some species of plants, but not others. It disrupts the cell surface membrane, but the extent of that disruption differs in different species. And scientists did an investigation on wheat plants, which are the crop, and wild oat plants, which are the weed of the wheat. And so what they did, they grew both plants in greenhouses. They put plants of each species into one of two groups, W and H. W was sprayed with water, in other words, no 2,4-D treatment, and group H was sprayed with 2,4-D, i.e. the herbicide, H. After spraying, they cut 40 discs from the leaves of plants in each group, placed them in flasks of water, deionized water, actually it's quite important, no ions, completely pure water, and after five minutes, they calculated the disruption of the membrane by measuring the concentration of ions in that deionized water or previously deionized water. Um, and the results are shown in table three. And we can see that for the wheat plants, they the difference between if they're in water or if they're in wheat, goes from 26 to 27. Arbitrary units, don't need to worry about what they are. Whereas with wild oats, the difference is 45 to 70. And then we're told the significance of this number. The LSD number is the smallest difference between the two means that would be significant at the P is less than or equal to 0 0.05 level. In other words, there has to be at least that difference, so seven for wheat and 10 for oats, for the difference to be significant. Okay, give three environmental factors that should be controlled when growing the plants. Well, these are the ones that I thought most obvious. The volume of water that they're watered with, 
the light intensity. So in other words, one can't be in a shaded part of the greenhouse and the other not. And also what I wanted to put on this last one, because this was the one that I found most difficult to think about. Obviously, it's the third one. Um, is that I wanted to put the amount of nutrients in the soil, but I was wary of just using the term nutrients. And so I kind of thought, I would now want to put the amount of mineral ions in the soil. But I also know that using the word amount is not great at A level. So what is the word that I can substitute for the word amount? It's concentration or possibly mass, but concentration is by far the better one to use. So here am I just speaking through my thought process as I am writing these questions. So, and here is the mark scheme. They clearly thought that concentration of mineral ions was, mineral ions was the most obvious. No, can I just say that isn't, that isn't the, that isn't how they do mark schemes, <laughs> but I'm just giggling at this one being the most difficult one. So volume of water, light intensity, and concentration of mineral ions in the soil. Um, yeah, those are the ones that just seemed the most obvious to me. You may well have thought of other ones. Evaluate the use of 2,4-D as a herbicide on a wheat crop that contains wild oats as a weed. Use all the information provided. So I have put here all the information that we need to be taking into account. The first thing is that it's asking you to evaluate. So I am immediately thinking this means pros and cons for using this 2,4-D as a herbicide and against using it. I need to try and pick out for and against from the data but once I've run out of things to say about the data, I want to then start critiquing the experimental description. And that's what these notes are to kind of keep me on track. I'm also going to use little subheadings to also keep me on track. So reasons for 2,4-D use. For 2,4-D use, that's confusing. So I have said 2,4-D has no effect on cell surface membrane disruption because I looked at these numbers 24, uh, sorry, 26 and 27 and went, that's pretty much the same number. I, I was not looking at this and thinking this is an increase. Okay, you'll understand why I've said that in a minute. Um, whereas has no effect, no effect on cell membrane disruption in wheat, but has a highly significant effect in wild oats. This is shown by the mean difference in iron concentration of 35, 45, uh, 70 minus 45, when the LSD number is 10. It's three times, which is why I put in the word highly significant. I wanted them to realize that I understood that. But then I couldn't really think of anything else to say for the use of the herbicide. And so I went on to the against. Do you know what I would do, actually? I, I should have just left myself a whole load of lines and done this more at the bottom of the spacing so that if I thought of something else, I could put it in up the top. Just, just a thought. Leave more lines than just one line if you want to use this method. However, this experiment was done using plants grown in a glass house, not in field conditions, which let's face it, is how wheat is grown. So here am I looking at the, looking at the experimental description and trying to pick it apart, in effect, see where its weaknesses are. And also, so they just tell you that, you know, membrane disruption, all the rest of it. But there isn't actually a direct link proven between cell membrane disruption and the fact that the plant actually dies. In other words, this is a mechanism of action for a herbicide, a weed killer. So this is what I put. Here is the mark scheme. I'm afraid, personally, again, I don't actually agree with mark point one. I would not say that 
the increase of one shows an increase. I personally think that is as likely to be due to chance as anything else, because it is way lower than this LSD value of seven. So I'm really surprised that Mark Point One says 2,4-D causes an increase in release of ions from wild oat cells. Um, and it does, oh, sorry. Do you know, I misread it. I should have given myself another mark. I misread this mark scheme. Right, I should have given myself mark point one here because this, I gave myself mark point two and mark point four. I completely misread this and I thought it was saying that this was showing um, an increase. I was just thinking that's just ridiculous. But yes, they, they have said what I thought is what they've said what I said. <laughs> they agree with me. How good of them. Um, OK, so I've got three marks out of out of the four. I would not have thought. What did I not thought? Right. I did not think of this one, that the loss of ions would could easily have brought about damage or um, death to the plant. Um, I did think of four, but I didn't think of three. And I certainly I wasn't thinking of things outside, as it were, of the remit of the of the um, experiment. So I ended up with three marks. I thought I only mean, got two. Um, scientists incubated the flask, contained the leaf discs at 26 degrees, gently shook the flask. Why? Um, suggest a reason and explain it. In other words, give the biological reasoning behind your suggestion. Notice. Oh, sorry, suggest, no, it doesn't say explain it, it just says suggest, sorry, my, my misread. So temperature, because it, temperature affects the rate of diffusion and they're shaken to make sure that none of them stick together um, and that they are all separated so that the water is in touch with every side. So I got mark point one and mark point two. I actually ended up saying both this and this um, because I wasn't convinced that just so they didn't stick together would be enough of an answer. Um, so, yeah. Question seven, describe how phagocytosis of a virus leads to the presentation of its antigens. So I wasn't quite sure where the start of this question was. So I went, I kind of described the whole of phagocytosis. So this is what I put. The virus is engulfed by the phagocyte, forming a phagosome. I'm using all the terminology of my phagocytosis knowledge. Lysosomes migrate towards and fuse with the phagosome, releasing hydrolytic enzymes which digest the virus. The antigen from the virus is presented on the cell surface membrane. So that's what I wrote. Here is the mark scheme. Um, and I would have got mark point one, two. I believe that digest is equivalent to destroyed um, and three. OK, and I was actually more specific. It was on the cell surface membrane, not just in any old membrane inside the cell. So describe how presentation of a virus antigen leads to the secretion of an antibody against this virus antigen. So we are doing basically summarising the whole of the cell mediated and humoral immune response. So the presented antigen binds with the complementary receptor on a specific T helper cells membrane, cell surface membrane. This causes the clonal expansion of this specific T helper cell. The T helper cells can then stimulate specific B cells which clonally expand to produce specific plasma cells which secrete antibodies which are complementary to the presented antigen. Here's the mark scheme. Here's the, um, here's the examiner's comments. 
And this is where I got my marks. So mark point one, mark point two. Notice I would always use it is, you know, it is important that we recognize that the helper, the T helper cells and the B cells are, are specific to the antigen that is in the body. Um, talked about clonal expansion and talked about the um, antibodies being secreted or produced. So collagen is a protein produced is a protein produced in joints such as the need. Rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disease and that's where the body's own immune system attacks their own cells. RA causes pain, swelling and stiffness in the joints. Scientists have found a virus that produces a protein very similar to human collagen. Oh, guess what's going to happen? Suggest how the immune response to this viral protein can result in the development of rheumatoid arthritis. Well, that's because the antibodies that your body is producing in response to the viral antigen actually are also complementary to your joints collagen. And therefore, your, the antibodies bind to the collagen and basically cause their destruction, cause the destruction of the collagen cells. Oh, the destruction of the uh, of the of the collagen itself. So that's what I wrote. And the antibody against the virus will bind to the collagen. So it's also complementary to. I think that is close enough wording to get the mark. Yeah, don't like attacks. It's not good enough. Um, a level. It isn't A level terminology. And this results in the human collagen. So I said that. I think this is the last question. Figure three shows two different ways of classifying the same three species of snake. Classification X based on observable characteristics. Classification Y based on comparisons of genetic characteristics. What do these classifications suggest about the evolutionary relationships between these three species of snake? The, because they have put evolutionary relationships in this question, I am going to make sure that I use the phrase most recent common ancestor. That is key. If ever you see evolutionary relationships, talk about the most recent common ancestor, because that's what they're interested in. So here is my answer. In classification X, Maclotty and Olivaceous have the most recent common ancestor than either of these two Papuana. So, because here is the most recent common ancestor of these two, here's the most recent common ancestor of all three of them. And I wrote very similar thing, but of course this shows a different Papuana and Maclotti, most recent common ancestor here, whereas this one is here. Sorry, this one's here, which is further back in time because this is the present day and that is going further back in time. Okay, so, and as a result, I got the two marks. Notice both of them have the thing in them, the phrase in the most recent common ancestor. Complete table four to show the missing names of the taxa. So we are doing our good old kingdom phylum class organ family genus species thing. Okay, but there is one above that, which is eukaryotes, which is the domain which you should know from the three domains um, that you've learned about as well. Um, eukaryotes, uh, archaea, and uh, eubacteria. So kingdom, phylum, class, order, family. Debate about the name of one of these species of snake. Some call it Liasis papuana and some Apodora papuana. 
give the name of the taxon about which the scientists disagree. Taxon is just the singular version of taxa, and the taxa are basically the groups, the kingdom, phylum, class, order, order, family. So this is the genus, because this part of the binomial name is the genus, and this is the species name. So it is, oh, sorry, I didn't say that I'd got the mark there. And so it's genus, and I got the mark. Notice gives the name of the taxon. If you give more than one name, even if this one is the right answer, if you've given the right answer, you won't get the mark. State three comparisons of genetic diversity that the scientists use. Now, do you know, I think the answer to this is weird. I'm going to be honest, because the most obvious answer is for you to say the order of the bases in the DNA. Obviously, genetic diversity. The slightly less, the second answer, which is less obvious, I completely agree, is the base sequence of the mRNA. Because mRNA is still considered genetic material. The third answer, I'm going to be honest, I know it, but I find it frankly weird. Because there, it is the order of the amino acids in a protein that is compared. I personally, that wouldn't jump to mind as a, as a way of measuring genetic diversity, except of course, the base sequence directly leads to the amino acid sequence. So of course I see the link, but I would really understand many A-level students only getting one mark out of three here, or possibly two and not thinking of answer three, but it is, all three of them. Okay, adult damselfly use a tracheal system for track, uh, gas exchange. Explain three wee ways in which an insect's tracheal system is adapted for efficient gas exchange. I'm going to be really honest here. I always teach a, a thing called fixed law. You don't strictly have to know it at A level, but it is the it is the um, it is the thing that says rate of diffusion is proportional to surface area times concentration gradient divided by diffusion pathway. And it means that if the surface area or the concentration, increase, uh, concentration gradient increases, so does the rate of diffusion. And if the diffusion pathway decreases, so does the rate of diffusion. And for me, this is the easiest way to spot adaptations because I'm looking for something that increases the surface area, something that increases the diffusion, uh, sorry, the concentration gradient, and something that decreases the diffusion pathway. And that is how I answered this question. So many tracheals increase the surface area. Body muscle contractions help ventilate the tracheals and therefore steepen the concentration gradient. And also the fact that tracheals reach every cell of the, what is it, damselfly, that means that there is the shortest possible diffusion pathway. So that was the route down which I went. Here is the mark scheme. So I ended up with these marks, mark point three, large number of tracheals, so large surface area. Mark point six, body can be moved, so therefore main, maintains, or I personally would say steepens the, did I say steepens? No, I said increases. I'd normally say steepens. I'm, I'm surprised I said increases. The number, you notice that steepens is literally referring to the gradient of a line. And of course, the steeper the line, the increase, the higher the number that is that gradient um, is. So increases is fine. I normally say steepens there. Okay, and finally, mark point two. Here it says highly branched or a large number of tracheals, so short diffusion distance. I'm really pretty sure tracheals reaching every cell absolutely inherently implies a large number. So I genuinely believe I would, if I was an examiner, 
I would absolutely want to give this mark because I believe it's saying the same thing. I have examined for AQA. Um, but it isn't absolutely in these, but it, it, not every judgment that examiners have to make are in these examiners' notes. It's worth pointing that out. Damselfly is a carnivore that actively hunts its prey. It has gills to obtain oxygen from water. Some other species of insect have larvae that are similar size and shape to damselfly and also live in water. These larvae do not actively hunt prey and do not have gills. They don't have the same requirement for gas exchange. Explain how the presence of gills adapts the damselfly to its way of life. So this is what I wrote. Gills in damselflies increases the gas exchange, allowing it to have a higher rate of respiration. Because I was thinking that not only does it get more oxygen, it can get rid of the carbon dioxide appropriately, which allows it to be more active because it's a predator. Gills, and then I, I put this in at the end. I wasn't, I must admit, increase the CO2. I w Actually, you know, and CO2, um excretion yeah of you know for for respiration to be allowed to continue so i only got mark point one because i don't think i gave my no i didn't give myself mark point two i'm pleased i didn't because these brackets even i don't think i don't think i've got this mark point two because they really wanted you be, to be saying it in the context of per unit time or per unit mass of the animal. And I simply didn't at all. And it says here, ignore references to um, uptake of more oxygen, which is what I have said. So, um, so I only got one mark out of two there. 9.3, measure the size of each gill lamellae. His results are shown, mean width, mean length with the uncertainty value. Calculate the mean surface of one surface area of one side of one gill lamellae. Assume that a gill lamellae is rectangular and give your answer an appropriate number of significant figures. OK, well, that's not too hard. It's 1.61 times by 6.12, which equals 2.83. That seemed reasonable to me because both of these go to two decimal places. So that's kind of what I did. And, and and the uncertainty is this. It's this figure divided, div, uh, sorry, this figure, yeah, divided by this figure. And when you have, when you are using the maths to times those two figures together, you add the uncertainties. That's the rule. And therefore, it would be that plus that, which equals 18.5%. Um, because otherwise, if you had times these two numbers together, you would have got kind of up to a 70% uncertainty in your surface area. And that just seems a bit high. OK, so there I got the marks. Oh, I didn't put them in. I'm sorry. Student uses an optical microscope to observe part of the damselfly larva gill. Here's the drawing. Suggest two ways that the student could improve the quality of her scientific drawing. Well, here is some issues here. Yeah, these lines are not joining. She's also crossed some over, you know, and so lines should always join. And here to me is the other obvious um, issue is that she's done a whole load of shading rather than draw single continuous lines. So all lines should join to others and no shading. So I got mark point one down here and I got mark point two. Only use single lines, don't use sketching. Ensure lines are connected. All right. Um, yeah, and also just crossed over lines here. That's not good either. Um, oh, do you know, I didn't even notice this. That was bad. I didn't even look up there. I looked at the drawing, these label lines. That's pretty shocking as well. That's really obvious. Um, she's, got a, she's got a title. 
she hasn't got a magnification. All of those absolutely fair enough comments. OK, last two bits of the questions. Contrast higher and optical microscope and a transmission mic uh, electron microscope work and contrast the limitations of their use when studying cells. Again, I decided to use headings to keep me focused, contrast how they work and then contrast their limitations. Now, how they work and limitations are down here, just so that you can see it clearly. Um, so here is the contrast in how they work. Optical microscope uses light, whereas a TEM uses electrons. Optical microscope focuses using lenses, whereas a TEM focuses using magnets. Optical microscopes can use colored stains, whereas TEMs can only use, they can't use colored stains, they can only use um, heavy metals. Uh, and how they work, mm, does this, is this how they work? Do you know, yeah, they can't, they can use light, you know, have live specimens in, in optical dead in um, TEMs. Um, because TEMs use a vacuum, so here, that is how they work. Yeah, that is really, I'm going to be honest with you. This isn't really about, this is, a, this is a limitation. But what I should have said, if I'm honest, is that I should have said TEMs use a vacuum and optical microscopes don't. That is a contrast in how they work. Limitations. Light microscopes have a much lower magnification and resolution compared to, T, sorry, light, yeah, compared to TEMs. TEMs cannot view live specimens, whereas light microscopes can. TEMs far more expensive than light microscopes. There's my answer, six marks. And here is where I got the marks. One, two, three, four, five. Fortunately, I wouldn't, I don't think I'd have got penalized by putting this in the wrong bit. Um, the marks that I missed, so yeah, I think I only did get five, yeah, I only got five marks. Um, the marks that I missed were three, because I didn't go into the detail to say, therefore they could see things in more detail, because I'd said that there was a greater resolution, I didn't say. Um, and I didn't, I wouldn't have thought of writing that, if I'm really honest, I just know I wouldn't have thought of it. And I, I wouldn't, I didn't, I didn't write that. So there we go. You know, I missed out on um, three of the marks. Um, not, I'm kicking myself a little bit for missing mark point three, but if I'm honest, not the other two. And I don't know why the whole thing about vacuum and non-vacuum isn't in that mark scheme, because it would seem really reasonable to me that that is a difference in the way that they work. Anyway. Okay. This shows an image from an optical microscope showing a flower bud and W and Z are undergoing meiosis. So we can see four cells in W and two cells in Z. Explain the appearance. So I have assumed that Z is two cells because it's the result of the first meiotic division. But I have noticed that this is a four mark question. So I can't just finish my answer there. I've got to add some more detail. So I put each cell has half the number of chromosomes of the parent cell because, of course, the homologous chromosomes have split during that first meiotic division. W are four cells as a result of the second meiotic division. Each one of those contains a single chromosome from each pair, n, i.e. the n number. So here is my marks, and I got three marks out of four. Now, I didn't give myself, uh, which mark point have I missed? I didn't get mark point four because I don't know, I'm not sure, even though this is absolutely true and relevant, 
it doesn't appear, except W contains half the amount of, oh no, I didn't write that. Um, I didn't write what was in mark point four. Didn't write it. Um, I only just wrote what was in mark point three. W shows haploid cells or cells containing N chromosomes. I wrote it out, but I'm not sure whether I absolutely needed to use the word N, probably not. I probably got this mark here, if I'm honest, not because I wrote the, the, the um, letter N, but I did only get three out of four marks, and um, hey ho. Okay, sorry, I was lying. This is the last bit. Environmental scientists investigated a possible relationship between air pollution and the size of seeds produced by one species of tree. He was provided with a very large number of seeds collected from a population of trees in the centre of a city and in the countryside. Describe how he should collect and process data from these seeds to investigate whether there is a difference in seed size between these two populations of trees. Now, I must admit the obvious thing to me for him to carry out this investigation He's also got to measure the flipping air pollution. But actually, strictly, so this is what I wrote. Firstly, he's got to measure the air pollution. However, I'm going to be really honest because this was not a mark. There you are. There's a, you know, spoiler alert. Describe how he'd collect and process the data to investigate whether there is, notice the question, whether there is a difference in seed size between the two populations. It's not whether there is a significant difference in seed side related to air pollution. Because if it was that, definitely, yeah, we're just ignoring the fact that it doesn't seem to have measured the air pollution. So this is what I then went on to write. He should then obtain a random sample of each set of seeds. And I was tempted, did I need to put more in here? Did I need to say how that he scooped out the seeds without looking? I didn't, you know, I wasn't sure because that can often be a mark point. The sample size should be large enough to be representative because I then kind of thought, how do I know how big a number of seeds he should sample? Because it depends on how many seeds he's got in this very large number of seeds. And therefore, I fell back on my knowledge of the brilliance of the word representative, because representative is a really useful word to use in these kinds of questions. Because if you say that the sample should be representative of a whole, you are kind of encompassing that it's got to be large enough and sampled appropriately in order to be representative of the whole. So I decided to chance my luck at that phrase. Um, I then went on to say he should then weigh each seed because we're talking about seed size. So how do we measure seed size? We've either got to measure their lengths or their masses. I'm gonna be really honest. Masses have got to be easier, isn't it? Well, I thought it would be. Um, weigh each seed, record its mass, calculate the mean mass of each population, and then use the student t-test and the tables of critical values to work out if the difference between the means is significant, i.e. p is less than 0.05 or 5%. Here's the mark scheme. It's five marks. So I got, okay, here's, here's this. So I got mark point one, I got mark point two. I, okay, all right, what's my, yeah, representative, except running mean. Yeah, I could have talked about running mean. Not many students would think of that though, anyway. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't not have thought of using any of those words, I'm gonna be honest. Way each seed record its mass, calculate the mean, do the student, look, I missed out this mark here because I didn't say to calculate the standard deviation as well. I just thought of the student T test. So I got, oh, I did actually end up with the five marks. Um, so yeah, and there we go. I think we're finished. So now let me you go back, let me end this 
and have a look to see if there are any more questions. Oh, just some thank yous. Thank you very much, guys. I hope this has been useful. Um, and those of you in YouTube land, you of course are going to have the uh, you're going to have the the um, the luxury of being able to watch at double speed and to uh, and to obviously stop the stop the video and look at the questions yourself. Hope it has been useful. See you next week. I'm going to do paper two AQA 2017 next week. See you soon. Bye bye.